Amen. Well, how many's glad to be here tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. God's good to us. Amen. Amen. Well, real quickly, we're not going to take very much time. We want to get Dr. Savell in the pulpit. But, uh, you know, some years ago, uh, I was sitting there on the front row, and I was, I was asking the Lord some questions, and uh, I said, uh, you know, there were things going on in the, in the church world, and I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing it, you know, things were going a different way. And I said, Lord, if I'm missing something, you know, I'm not afraid to do something different. And he said to me, he said, you preach the pure word of faith in the manner you learned it. And if you stay with your fathers, you'll always stay safe. And, uh, you know, I, I, I look at that and, you know, one of the men that we learned the pure word of faith from is with us tonight. And that's such a blessing. You know, uh, the Bible says to give honor to whom honor is due. And, you know, there are many of us sitting in here tonight. We would have never known that God wanted his, like we sang, his unmerited favor to be on our life if it hadn't been for Brother Jerry. You know, uh, there are people in here, the message of, of faith and victory and healing and prosperity came to you through Brother Jerry. And so we want to we want to make sure that we always honor that gift. Amen. And, uh, and make sure that we, we open the door for honor. And it is a great honor to have him with us. And uh, always, every time he's with us, we're so honored to have him. And uh, God's going to speak to us tonight. How many, how many are prayed up? How many prayed about it this week and said, Lord, I want you to speak to me tonight? Amen. Because utterance is greatly affected by the hearers. And I promise you that Brother Jerry came full tonight. And so what we receive from that fullness is going to depend on how we pull on it. And so I want you to get your, your puller out and get your catcher out because it's coming. And it's coming in an accelerated fashion. Amen. I believe that. So would you stand on your feet tonight and help me welcome the ministry gift of Dr. Jerry Savelle. Pastor, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can be seated. Good to be with you once again. And always a joy to be with Pastor Philip. And uh, we've been looking forward to being up here in Kansas. I am in Kansas, right? Yes. I've been all over the world since the first year, and I'm, I have to look at my schedule to see where I'm at. But uh, I was told I was flying to Kansas, so I'm glad to be with you again. Amen. Everybody happy tonight? Yes. Everybody full of faith, full of joy? Yes. Turn around and tell somebody, I'm in the right place tonight. I'm in the right place tonight. Amen. Praise God. Hey, Rev. <laughs> all right. Let's open our Bibles, uh, first of all tonight, to uh, Psalm 92. And while you're turning there, I want to make mention of some things that are important before we share the Scripture with you. Coming into 2018, the Holy Spirit instructed me to declare everywhere that I preached throughout this year that it would be days of glory, days of flourishing, and days of abounding. That sounds like God to me, doesn't it to you? Days of glory, days of flourishing, and days of abounding. Look at somebody and tell them, this year, I will experience days of glory, days of flourishing, and days of abounding. That's my declaration of faith. And if you really believe it'll happen to you, give God praise in advance. Amen. Hallelujah. Days of glory implies manifestations of God's presence, God's power, and God's goodness. Those are three major components of the glory of God. It's a manifestation of His presence, a manifestation of His power, and a manifestation of His goodness. In Exodus chapter 33, Moses said, I beseech thee, show me your glory. Show me your glory. When Moses said that, it was not because he'd never experienced the glory before, it was because he had. And once you have experienced the glory of God, you can't get enough of it. You want to experience it more and more and more. Why? Because it's manifestations of God's presence. Anybody ever been in the presence of God? Yes. Did you like it? Yes. Did you want to experience it more? Yes. Well, then you understand why Moses said, show me your glory. Amen. Have you ever experienced the power of God? Yes. Did you enjoy it? Yes. 
Did you want to experience it more? Yes. Well, that's the reason Moses said, show me your glory. Have you ever experienced the goodness of God? Yes. Did you enjoy it? Yes. Would you like to experience it more? Yes. Well, then that's the reason why you need to be saying, Lord, show me your glory. Once again, not because we haven't experienced it before, but because we have, and we can't get enough of it. I am celebrating 49 years of ministry. I've been walking by faith for 49 years. Next February will be 50 years. And I have learned in those 49 years that experiencing the glory of God is the answer and the solution to every test, every trial, every uh, adversity that you and I will ever go through. If we can experience the presence of God, the power of God, and the goodness of God, there's absolutely no way Satan can ever defeat us. Because in his presence, the Bible says, the enemy, the avenger, is stopped and stilled. Amen. That simply means, in the presence of God, every assignment of the devil against you is broken. Hallelujah. The Bible also says in the book of Acts that uh, there's a refreshing that comes from the presence of God. The Bible also says in the book of Psalms, that uh, in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. Yes. So that is an answer, a solution to anything that you would ever go through. And if you can experience his presence, his power, and his goodness, then once again, there's no way Satan can ever defeat you. And somebody ought to shout Hell, hallelujah and glory to that. Amen. So lift up your hands right now and say, Lord, Lord show me your glory, show me your glory. Every, day, every day, this year, this year and, beyond. and beyond. Amen. Amen. And remember now, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18, where Moses said these words, Lord, beseech, I beseech thee, show me your glory. God responded in verse 19. The first two words was, I will. Yes. I will. Yes. And I believe if Moses experienced the glory of God time and time again, then it's God's will for you and I to experience the glory of God time and time again. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, once again, days of glory implies experiencing His presence, His power, and His goodness. Days of flourishing implies thriving, booming, growing vigorously, expanding, prosperity, making steady progress, and being at a high point in your life. That's what flourishing means. Let me say it again. Thriving, booming, growing uh, vigorously, expanding, prospering, making steady progress, and being at a high point in your life. Praise God. Does that sound good to anybody? Yes. Days of flourishing. Psalm 92, 12 says, in fact, let's, let's look at that now. Psalm 92 and verse 12. It says, The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. So notice it says the righteous shall flourish. They shall flourish like the palm tree. They'll grow like the cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord. Oh, it looks like there's a stipulation here. Didn't say those who drift from one church to another. Did my mic go off? I didn't get much response there. <laughs> We're talking about faithful people. That's who flourish. Proverbs 28, 20 says, The faithful shall abound with blessings. Amen. Faithful people. Faithful people, they, uh, they stick with God. They stick with the Word. They're not easily moved. They're not easily shaken. They're not tossed with the wind, like uh, Paul says in Ephesians, uh, like children uh, that are drifting to and fro, tossed with the wind, every wind of doctrine. You know, they just stick with the Word. You know, I'm, I, I remember talking to T.L. Osborne many years ago. And Brother Osborne said, uh, we were talking about different things that are being taught, and that was a good 25 years ago. 
And he said, you know, Jerry, there's nothing new going on in the body of Christ where teaching is concerned. He said, I heard these same things years ago when I first started. All the devil does is give it a new name. Yeah. Amen. And it's just designed to get people off the Word. Yeah. You know, I came into the Word of Faith through Kenneth Copeland in 1969. I was a, I was a young businessman. I owned an automotive business. I heard the call of God watching Oral Roberts on television in 1957. Uh, but that's not what I wanted to do, so I ran from it just as hard and fast as I could. And uh, I always dreamed of owning my own automotive business. And uh, by the time I was 21 years old, I owned that business. And uh, Brother Copeland came in 1969. Uh, we lived in Shreveport, Louisiana. And the church my wife grew up in, uh, her pastor, Jack Moore, he was best friends and traveled with uh, William Brannan and, and uh, he knew A.A. A. Allen and Jack Cole and, and uh, Gordon Lindsay was one of his best friends. And so people like that came to my wife's church when she was growing up all the time because he was best friends with them. And uh, I, I hadn't been going to church in a while. And Carolyn kept telling me that this man that was there for a, a week she said, uh, I want you to come and hear him. I said, Carolyn, I don't want to go hear another preacher. And she said, well, this man is not like all the rest. I said, Carolyn, you tell me that every time. And when I get there, you lie. They all just like. All he wants is my money and my chicken. You know, and, <laughs> you know back in 69, you know, preachers didn't stay in hotels. They stayed in people's homes, you know. And the pastor, every time they'd have a guest speaker, it was either, uh, well, they, he always asked my in-laws, my mother and father-in-law, if they would put up the guest speaker. And they always did. But Carolyn always fed them. And I'd come home from work, you know, and I'm, I was a paint and body man and owned a body, paint and body shop. And I'd come home with Bondo dust from head to toe and grease from one end to the other. And last thing I wanted to do was go hear somebody preach and talk me out of my money, you know. And, and, but sometimes I'd come home, and I don't know why, but it seemed like all those guest preachers were big and fat. And I, I thought all they do is eat, sleep, and mooch, you know. Talk about how hard it is to live by faith and then beg us to try it. And I thought, what well, I want to try to live by faith? You're not doing a good job of it yourself. If you weren't, you wouldn't be begging for money all the time, you know. And, and so my mother and father-in-law kept them up. And they lived next door to us. So that meant every preacher that came to town, to our church anyway, or my wife's church, I didn't go. But every preacher that came to her church, I had to meet. Because her parents lived next door. And uh, so I'd wind up meeting them and, and I, didn't, I wasn't impressed by it, you know, and <laughs> And uh, so I'd come home sometimes in the evening, tired, worn out, ready to have dinner, and some big preacher sitting there eating, the, <laughs> eating my chicken. He always ate the best part. The time he got through, all he was left was a gizzard and a wing, you know. And <laughs> so I, I had a bad impression of preachers. And I kept thinking, why don't they get a real job? You know, because I worked hard. My daddy taught me to work when I was a young boy. My daddy never told me that about any two scriptures in the Bible, but these two. He said they were in the Bible, and I believed him. He said, a boy that don't work, don't eat. Well, I like eating, so I went to work, you know. And then he told me after I got married, a man that don't take, take, take care of his family is worse than an infidel. Well, I didn't know what an infidel was, but it didn't sound good, so I didn't want to be one. So I went to work and I took care of my family, you know. So I just grew up working hard. You know, I started, I started uh, my dad started teaching me the trade, uh, paint and body work when I was just a young boy. And uh, that's how I made my money when I was going to school. That's how I got money to go out on dates on, you know. If I didn't have money to take some girl out on a date, I'd go to some paint and body shop and, and work. And so I'd have money to go out, you know. So I, I worked. But it didn't look like to me these preachers worked. They just ate, slept, and took advantage of people. <laughs> Anybody ever met preachers like that? <laughs> Well, then this kind of Copeland comes to, to Shreveport. And uh, my wife was going every service, three services a day for a week. 
and she went to every service. I think my wife had her own key to the place. And uh, she lived down there all the time. You know, it was all, everything was church, church, church. And uh, my dad and I, we raced automobiles. Uh, uh, my dad raced all my young life. I grew up on racetracks, and dad and I were hauling uh, race cars all over the southern part of the United States. And sometimes I'd come home just worn out, you know, and three o'clock in the morning after hauling these cars back and, and uh, my wife would put her hand on my chest and start praying in that language. I hated it because I didn't know what she was saying. And I'd take her hand and put it back on her side of the bed. And then in a little while, she'd put her hand back on my chest and start praying in English. And it was always the same prayer. Lord, don't let him have any more fun until he surrenders his life to you. <laughs> you know? I'd take her hand, put it back on her side of the bed. I'd say, Carolyn, quit praying that. You, I don't care if you move into the church. I think you got your own key to the place anyway. But leave me alone. I'm doing what I want to do. You do what you want to do. I'm living my life. And it became two people living under the same roof going two different directions. But I was determined, you know, I knew I loved her. And divorce was not an option. I never thought of divorce. I asked Jesse the planets one time. I said, did you and Kathy ever consider divorce? He said, divorce, no. Murder, yes. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I never considered divorce, even though we were going two opposite directions. I knew I loved her. Um, and I thought, you know, I can tolerate the preaching all the time to me, but uh, just let me live my life. Well, then this Kenneth Copeland comes and, and uh, Carolyn says, I promise you he's not like the rest. I said, Carolyn, I'm not going. He is like the rest. You're just saying that to try to get me to go. I'm not going. So the last night that he was there, uh, Carolyn said, Jerry, this is his last night. If you will go with me tonight, I promise you, I will. And if you don't like him, I'll never ask you to go again. I said, and that's the deal I've been waiting on. <laughs> Do you promise I won't have to go again if I don't like him? She said, if you don't like him, I'll never ask you to go again. I said, all right, I'm going. And I already don't like him. <laughs> she said, well, you hadn't even heard him yet. I said, oh, he's just like the rest. I know I won't like him. But I'm going because you promised if I go, I'll never have to go again if I don't like him. And so I went and cleaned up, you know, and we got in the car and started toward the church. And I said, now, who is this guy that you're so thrilled about? She said, Kenneth Copeland. I said, Kenneth Copeland. I know who that is. She said, how would you know? You don't go to church. How would you know Kenneth Copeland? I said, I didn't say I know him. I know the name. She said, well, how would you know the name? You don't go to church. I said, well, back in 1957, there was a man on the radio station, the rock and roll station, and his name was Kenneth Copeland. He had a hit song. It was called The Pledge of Love. She said, it's not him. I said, well, how do you know? She said, I just know it's not him. So I said, well, I'm going for two reasons now. Number one, number one, if I don't like him, I'll never have to go again. And as soon as he gets through preaching, I'm going to ask him if he was the same guy that had the hit record on the radio in 1957 called The Pledge of Love. I'd like to be right one time. Yeah. Are any other husbands in here like to be right one time? <laughs> and so I said, I'm going. I'm going to ask him. She said, don't embarrass me. I said, I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm just going to ask him. Well, I got to the service and... Uh, he started out preaching, you know, and, and so far everything sounded good, but I'm still not totally locked in yet, impressed, but I hadn't got up and left yet. And so about 15 minutes into his sermon, he just stopped. He walked away from the pulpit and he said, I don't know why I'm saying this. It has absolutely nothing to do with my sermon, but I guess somebody here needs to hear this. 1957, I had a hit record on the radio called The Pledge of Love. <laughs> He said, I was headed for star, uh, rock and roll stardom. Yeah. Dick Clark had invited uh, everybody that had a hit record in the top 20 to go on tour and promote our records. He said, Fats Domino, uh, Little Richard, uh, Buddy Holly, everyone that had a hit record in the top 20 were going on the tour with Dick Clark. And he said, and just about the time the tour started, I got drafted and I had to report to the military and uh, the army and while everybody else was out promoting their records on this tour and becoming rock and roll stars, I'm in basic training. And by the time I got out of the service, nobody remembered my hit record. He said, and I attribute that to my mama's praying because she knew I was supposed to be a preacher. 
Now, I don't know why I said that. I guess somebody need to hear it. Let's get back to the Bible. <laughs> he said that for my benefit. Yeah. Because right now, I looked over at Carolyn, and she said, I didn't know he was the same guy. And I'm now captivated. And I'm hearing the word like I'd never heard it before. And he preached from Mark 11, 23, and 24 on the subject of faith. And boy, it hit me right square in the eyes. Now, I didn't go forward that night. I went home. But when I got home, I couldn't sleep. I, I just couldn't sleep. Finally, about 3 o'clock in the morning, I got up. And uh, went into my living room. And I said, Lord, I don't know why you still want me. I've been running from you all my life. And I said, uh, if everything that man said tonight was true, then that's what I'm going to believe. And that's what I will preach. If you still want me. I said, now, I want you to realize that when you get me, you're, you're getting a failure. I've been a failure. I've been a quitter all my life. If I, if I got under pressure, I'd look for the path of least resistance. Always. I said, you, want, you, you get me, you get a failure. And he said, don't worry about it, son. I'm a master at making champions out of failures. All I'm asking you to do is surrender your life to me. And so I lifted my hands right there in my living room, 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, was experienced a glorious salvation, immediately filled with the Holy Spirit. And I prayed in tongues for about four hours. I couldn't quit. And when I stopped about seven in the morning, I saw my wife and my mother-in-law sitting on the, on the sofa. And uh, I turned to them and I said, guess what happened to me? My wife said, I know. I said, well, how long have you been in here? She said, well, about 3.30 this morning. I woke up and I noticed you weren't in bed. And then I heard this noise in the living room. I got up. And went in there and saw what is happening to you. And I called Mama. I said, Mama, you got to come see what's happening to Jerry. 3.30 in the morning. Mama come over there. Because me and Mama-in-law didn't get along either. Because she preached to me more than my wife did. I don't know where she got the scripture about nag your son-in-law into the kingdom. You know. But anyway, I, 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 me and her didn't get along. And so I walked over to my wife. I kissed her. I said uh, forgive me for being so stubborn, but you're going to have a brand new husband from now on. I've surrendered my life to the Lord. I've, I've accepted the call to preach. I'm going to shut my business down, and I'm going to prepare for the ministry. And then I walked over to my mother-in-law, and I asked her to forgive me for being so stubborn, and, and I, I thanked her for not quitting praying for me, not giving up on me. And then I kissed her right on the lips. Never had done that before and told her I loved her. And then that's when I knew my experience was real. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it wasn't a religious experience. Boy, when you kiss your mama-in-law right on the lips and tell her you love her, that's a real deal right there, praise God. <laughs> Amen. And from that day, I haven't had a mother-in-law since. I have another mother. And she thinks me and God hung the moon. <laughs> and I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't tell her any different. So notice here, what, I, what I'm leading up to is the word of faith is all I know. That's what I started out on. That's what I've been preaching for 49 years. It's how I've lived for 49 years. And praise God, it's still working for me. In fact, it's been working all these years. And I decided a long time ago that, that I'm not interested in anything else because my mama didn't raise a fool. Why would you change when this is still working? When it's still effective? When it's still producing? Amen. When I went into the ministry and I shut my business down, I had business debts that I still had to pay. I had personal debts that I still owed. And uh, Brother Copeland taught me just in the, in the time that I began to listen to him. And then eventually uh, uh, I went to work with him and became his associate minister. And he taught me about the principles of seed time and harvest. And, and I learned how to sow my way out of debt. Praise God. I haven't been in debt in years. Praise God. And I've been flourishing. Hallelujah. Amen. And it's really not my fault. It's God's fault. Because all I'm doing is doing what He said. The Bible says the righteous shall flourish. Well, I'm one of the righteous. Amen. We just got through singing about it. It's not because of what I've done. It's what He did. He who was made to be sin, who knew no sin, 
has caused us to become the righteousness of God. Amen. 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 But there's a little more to it than just accepting Christ and, and knowing that you are the righteousness of God. You have right standing with God. That's what that means. You have right standing with God. But there's a little more to it to flourish. And I think the Amplified addresses this. It says it this way. The uncompromisingly righteous shall flourish. Uncompromisingly righteous. Uh, there's righteous people, then there's uncompromisingly righteous. In other words, they, they, they won't bend. They won't bow. They don't give up. Amen. They stay with God. They stick with the word. And the Bible says, the uncompromisingly righteous shall flourish. It goes on to say in the Amplified, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. Amen. I'll be 72 years old this year, and I'm still bringing forth fruit. In fact, my wife thinks I'm a little, you know, touched in the head because <laughs> I've always looked forward to getting older. The moment I have a birthday, I start looking forward to my next one. When I, when I turned 71, I was already talking about I'll be 72 this year. She says, why are you so excited about getting older? I said, because the Bible says, even in my old age, I'll still be bearing fruit, praise God. Amen. I haven't slowed down at all. I travel all over the world. Uh, I'm away from my home 22 days out of every month, preaching the Word of God somewhere around the world. And praise God, I've got... I've got uh, uh, vitality. Uh, I, I, I'm highly motivated. I'm energetic. Praise God. I'm acting like a 40 year old. Amen. Brother Copeland's 81 years old and he's acting like a 45 year old. Amen. We just don't know quit. We don't know turn back. We don't know uh, compromise. We just keep going with God, sticking with his word and God keeps blessing. God keeps blessing. God keeps blessing and God keeps blessing. Come on, give the Lord a shout. Praise God. Amen. And I've never had to beg anyone for a dime in 49 years. I've never taken advantage of people, manipulated people. And my ministry has no debts. Every building's paid for. Airplanes paid for. Everything in the ministry's paid for. I got offices all over the world. And praise God, we're flourishing. Why? Because I've been faithful. And that's a promise to anybody that will remain faithful. Can you say amen? Are there any faithful people in here tonight? Well, give the Lord your best shout because you're headed for flourishing. Glory to God. Days of flourishing. That means, once again, thriving, you know, booming, growing vigorously, expanding. Praise God, we're expanding at the ministry. Glory to God. Prospering, making steady progress and being at a high point in your life. Now that's not to say we don't have attacks. That's not to say uh, we're not challenged. That's not to say we don't have adversity. Amen. That's just a part of living. Right. Amen. It's a part of living by faith. Yes. Amen. Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulations. Yes, sir. Yes. Well, I'm still in the world. Right. Are you still in the world? Yes, sir. Then you will have tribulation. You'll be confronted with adversity. However, it doesn't end there, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. So I know, praise God, how this ends. I'm going to overcome. Amen. 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 Jesus has seen to it that nothing Satan can do can defeat me if I won't give up, if I won't quit, amen. if I stay uncompromising. Amen. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 I was uh, preaching with Brother Roberts, Oral Roberts at, at ORU, maybe center there one time. And... and uh, uh, Brother Roberts had preached first and then I came up behind him to, to, to preach and he told me as I was, uh, as he was going to his seat, he said, now Jerry, you, you preach and then you minister to the people. Pray for the sick or whatever the Lord leads you to do. And so I had a prayer line at the end and there was several thousand people in the maybe center and I had about 200 people come up in the prayer line. And uh, I'm just working my way down the prayer line and I got in front of this one man and he said, uh, I stopped, I said, sir, what do you want? What do you need? He said, I want you to ask God that I will never have another test, another trial, another challenge, or another adversity. I said, is that what you want? He said, yes, that's what I want. So I laid my hands on him. I said, Lord, let this man die. 
He said, I don't want to die. I said, that's what you just asked me. That's what you just told me to ask God for. I don't want to die. I said, well, sir, I don't know any other way that you'll never have a test, a trial, adversity, challenge, than leave the planet. You have to die and leave the planet. So, Lord, let him die. He said, I don't want to die. I said, well, do you want to live? He said, I want to live. I said, Lord, let him live. <laughs> Amen. But challenges are a part of life. They're a part of the life of faith. Anybody ever told you live by faith and never have another challenge? They lied. One of the greatest men of faith that ever walked this planet beside Jesus himself was the Apostle Paul. Go read about his life. See if you find any adversity there. See if you find any challenges there. But you'll also notice in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul making this statement. None of these things move me. None of these things move me. Amen? So he's not saying, I would like to live in a perfect world where there are no challenges. No, he, he, he realized that there would be challenges, but he made the decision that it was not going to move him. It was not going to shake him. He was not going to get off the word. Amen. He's not going to get out of faith. And he's just going to keep walking the line, so to speak. Amen. Toe the line, so to speak. And depend on God to deliver him. And he did write in Timothy and say, persecutions and afflictions, uh, the Lord has delivered me out of them all. Hallelujah. Amen. Does all mean all up here like it means all in Texas? Amen. No exceptions. Hallelujah. So God will deliver you. Amen. But notice it takes this uncompromising stand. Now, a lot of Christians are not willing to do that. You know, there's a lot of fair weather Christians, what I call them. They're, they're, they love God and they can sing and they can shout with the best of them as long as everything's going well. But when the storms of life hit them, you know, they start backstroking. You don't see them in church for a while. They quit tithing. Uh, next time you see them, they're, they're, they're not watching what comes out of their mouth anymore. Did I touch a nerve or what? No, no they, they, they kind of, they start compromising. Amen. But the faithful, the faithful, they're like Paul. None of this moves me. Hallelujah. None of this moves me. You know, uh, last year I was, uh, I had a physical. You know, the year before I was about to turn 70 <clears throat> and uh, I went to take a physical. When I used to fly my, my airplane myself, uh, the, the FAA required me to do a physical every year. But when I quit flying and, and have pilots do that for me, uh, I, I wasn't required to have a physical. And it got to where it was getting more and more difficult for me to schedule a time for a physical because I was gone all the time. And when I was home, you know, they were booked. And when I was gone, they could get me in and it just wasn't working out. And so finally, my, my, especially my daughters, they said, Daddy... Uh, we want you around for a long, long time. And they said, go to have a physical. I said, well, why, girls? There's nothing wrong with me. I, I, I probably visited a doctor's office other than a physical back when I was flying. Maybe 10 times in 40-something years, you know. And uh, I, I've enjoyed divine health. They said, well, Daddy, you're getting older now, so just go get a physical. If there is something wrong, then you can target your faith there. And so... I went to have a physical. Well, they found out that this, this, uh, this uh, artery that goes from your heart to the brain uh, was 90% blocked. And when I was going through the test, the doctor looked down at me and he said, how are you alive? I said, what are you talking about? He said, I don't know how you got in here uh, without passing out in the, in, in the parking lot. I said, sir, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. What are you talking about? He said, this artery is 90% blocked and it can cause an a aneurysm. It can cause a stroke, it can, uh, various things. He said, you haven't had any symptoms? I said, not any. In fact, before I came here today, I just got off a, a motorcycle trip in South Texas, uh, or West Texas, 107 degree weather every day. I didn't even work up a sweat, much less have any symptoms. Now, I just got home yesterday from that trip. 
He said, well, I don't know how you're alive. I said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and he said, uh, well, I'm, I'm strongly recommending that you go in and have the plaque removed. And this will require a routine surgery. And he went on, he said, you could walk out of here and maybe live for six months or maybe three months. Or you could walk out of here and die before you get to your car. I said, well, that's not likely. And the girl said, Daddy, do whatever he tells you to do. I said, what do you recommend? He said, well, it's a routine surgery. We just go in and do an incision, remove the plaque, sew you back up, and you'll be in the hospital a day, a day and a half. And, and then you'll come back home and maybe take a couple of weeks off before you start your schedule again. And the girls kept saying, Daddy, do it. I said, okay, I'll do that then. So they went, took me to the hospital the next day, got prepped, and uh, uh, go ready, get ready to go into surgery. And the last thing I remember him saying was, routine surgery. Day and a half in the hospital, back home. Take a couple of weeks to recover, then you can hit the trail again. So that's what I remember when I went under. When I came to, a few days later, I'd, I was told, and of course, uh, I, I wasn't uh, really functioning because they told me that I'd had a stroke after the surgery. And it left my right arm totally paralyzed, couldn't use it at all, partial right leg paralyzed, and the worst part of it all, total memory loss. I didn't know my wife, I didn't know my children, I didn't know anybody in the family. I had no memory whatsoever. The doctor would come in and take a, a coloring book, a child's coloring book, and put it in front of me with pictures of leaves and butterflies and birds, and he'd point and said, what is this? I, I, hadn't, I didn't have a clue. I couldn't speak. The only word I could say was yes. That's the only word I could say. Total memory loss. When he pointed to my wife and said, who is this? I didn't know. He pointed to my daughters. I didn't know. Uh, Brother Copeland came to pray for me. And uh, I didn't know Brother Copeland. Brother Jesse came. Jesse DePlantis came. I didn't know them. And, and uh, uh, Carolyn told me, she said, Brother Copeland stood over your bed and preached to you for two hours, just pouring the Word into you. Just pouring the Word. And she said, even though you barely knew he was there. She said the beautiful thing was the entire time he was there, you were able to pray in the Holy Ghost for that two hours while he preached. See, your, your, your spirit man is not connected to your brain. And so I was able to pray in the Holy Ghost. And then when he left, she said you stopped praying and, and then you, you, you couldn't remember anybody or even remember he was there. And I couldn't, I couldn't even tell you, point to a bird. I didn't know what it was. A butterfly, I didn't know what it was. That's horrible. And so uh, uh, finally, uh, the doctor came in one day and he said, told my wife, and I'm, I'm not aware of this, she told me later after the recovery. She said, the doctor came in every day and told me that you would never be normal again. You would never preach again. It's not likely that you'd ever be able to walk correctly again. Probably never have the use of your right arm again. And she said, and I told that doctor every time he came in there, you don't know my husband and you don't know our God. Amen. Amen. She said, my husband will recover. Amen. She said, you let him out of this hospital and you get him, let him get back home in his own environment. He will recover and his recovery will be immediate. Amen. So I didn't know that was all being said until she told me later after I recovered. And uh, so anyway, finally one day he came in and said, that he was going to release me. But then they said, we're going to have him to go to a, they called it a, a physical boot camp where they, uh, therapy and so forth. And then also they wanted to put me in this chamber and stay there and out for hours every day to rebuild the cells in my brain. And uh, so we got home and uh, I still don't have memory. Uh, I just just barely can remember certain things. 
I know my family now, you know. And this, this is going on for days. This is not routine, by the way. <laughs> this is going on for days. But then when I got home, and in my own environment, my granddaughter became my coach. And she would set me down at a table, and she'd take a piece of putty and put coins in it. And she'd take my right arm and lay it on those coins, as my hand on, those, on that clay. She'd say, Papa, dig those coins out of there. I couldn't move my fingers. If, if, if I dropped my arm, it was just dead weight. And she put it on there and said, get those coins out of there. I, I couldn't move my fingers. And she said, Papa, the, most, the sermon that most people remember you by is don't quit. <laughs> you preached it all your, all your time in the ministry. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. I'm not letting you quit, Papa. I'll dig those coins out of there. And it was all I could do to move one finger. And finally I dug and dug. It seemed like for hours. And finally I got one coin out. Oh, and a big smile came to my face. It was like relief. And then she hit it again and put my hand back in there. <laughs> I couldn't tell her. I, I wanted her to go home now. But <laughs> and she said, you're not quitting, Papa. You're not quitting. You're not a quitter. And, and she kept at it, kept at it. And finally, I was able to dig all those coins out of there. And then finally, I, I told her, I said, I pointed to my shop out back. Uh, I've been still, my hobby is restoring classic cars and motorcycles and things. And I have a shop out back. My wife says, quit calling it a shop. It's a museum. <laughs> so I have a museum out back with all these classic cars and, and classic motorcycles. And uh, I pointed to my granddaughter. That's where I wanted to go. And she said, what do you want, Papa? And I pointed. I couldn't use my right arm. I pointed. She said, you want to go to your shop? And I, I motioned, indicated yes. And so I told her, uh, I walked into my study to get the keys out of my desk. And I gave them to her. And we went out there and we unlocked the shop and turned the alarm off, turned the lights on. And I walked over to the oldest motorcycles I have in there, which is a 1942 Harley. And I stood over it and I... In my mind, I had determined I was going to start everything in there before I left that building. Because faith without corresponding right. actions is void of power. Right. And so I knew I couldn't expect, you know, this great manifestation of healing by doing nothing. So I walked over to that motorcycle. I couldn't remember how to start it. So I prayed in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit reminded me how to start it. And starting a 42 Harley is not easy, even if everything in your body is working fun uh, properly. <laughs> it's kickstart. It's not electric. You know, everything is it's like starting a Model T. And I got it started. Then I went to the 46 Harley. Got it started. 57 Harley. And I went to every motorcycle. Got them all started. Then I went to my classic cars. Got everything in there started. Everything was running in the museum. And I, I thought to myself, the, the, the smell of fumes is exhilarating. <laughs> And then I turned everything off. And I indicated to my granddaughter that I, I wanted to go back to the house. Now, I'm having to hold my arm up like this, and I'm walking like this. My speech is not the way it used to be. Uh, I can't remember certain things. And I still don't know any scripture I'd ever studied or any sermon I ever preached. And so... Uh, I asked Rachel to give me the keys so I could lock the door. And I reached over here like this and got the keys. And Rachel said, Papa, did you see what you just did? I said, what? She said, you got them with your right hand. Amen. And I realized, praise God, I got my arm back. Yeah. Yeah. Same time, I got my leg back, praise God. Amen. I mean, I, when I walked out of that shop, everything started working. Yes, sir. Not only that, but between the shop and the house, my memory came back. And I remembered every praise scripture, God. every sermon, praise God. And within three weeks, listen to this, within three weeks, I was traveling around the world Amen. and I was going a whole month preaching Amen. in nations all over the world. Do I look like a man who had a stroke, no, praise sir. God. No. no sir. Why? Because quit is not an option. Amen. 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 Quit's not an option. Amen. The faithful don't quit. Amen. And the faithful flourish. Yes, sir. I'm flourishing in health. Hallelujah. I'm flourishing uh, in prosperity. 
I, I'm flourishing in the ministry. Praise God. Not only that, I'm getting older and I'm still bearing fruit. Hallelujah. Somebody give the Lord a shout. Praise God. Amen. Here where it says, and they shall be fat. I'm not fat. Does this look like fat? No, that's not talking about weight wise. It's talking about prosperous. In the little Hebrew, it's abounding. It's prospering. So it says, even in old age, the faithful shall flourish, they shall prosper, they shall abound, and they'll still be bringing forth fruit. Yes, sir. That's the promise of God. Yes, sir. Can you say amen? amen? So say this again. I believe, I believe my, 2018 my 2018 will be days of glory, days of, days, of abounding, days of abounding, and days of flourishing. Days of flourishing. And give the Lord another shout, Hallelujah. praise God. Amen. Now, once again, you and I have a, a part in this, and our part is being faithful. Amen. Once again, the Amplified says, The uncompromisingly righteous shall flourish. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They are living memorials to show that the Lord is upright and faithful. A living memorial. That's what I am. I'm a living memorial, Amen. praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A living memorial, a memorial to the fact that my God is a faithful God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've been serving Him now for 49 years, Glory and I have this testimony. He's never let me down, not one Glory time. God. My Amen. God has been Amen. faithful yes. every, every step of the Amen. way, and I believe, praise God, Hallelujah. He's going to continue to be faithful. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And not only that, I'm determined to be faithful to Him Amen. and faithful to His Word. So my best days are not behind me. They're just ahead of me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? And the same is true for you if you remain faithful. Can you say amen once again? So once again, please notice that this is God's promise to those who remain faithful. They will flourish. Uncompromising means sturdy, inflexible, not willing to give in or give up nor willing to make concessions. And finally, to become unwavering. Hallelujah. Unwavering in our faith. This is how Paul described Abraham when Abraham had experienced a, a, a supernatural visitation from God when he, turned 90, when he was about 99 years old. And it's recorded in the book of Genesis. And it's also recorded in Romans chapter 4. Let's go to Romans and pick up on what Paul said about Abraham's faithfulness. Notice the terminology that Paul uses. Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> In verse 18, speaking of Abraham, <clears throat> who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, and then verse 19, uh, can you open that for me, Ken? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Honey and lemon juice. I'll drink to that. <laughs> you have to clarify everything these days, okay? <coughs> That's what it is, honey and lemon juice. <laughs> That's as strong as I get, praise God. <clears throat> so notice verse 19 and being not weak in faith he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb verse 20 he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform Notice, he staggered not. That's uncompromising. Amen. That's unwavering. And the Amplified says, no unbelief or distrust made him waver. The book of James in James chapter 1 says in verse 6, that if a man wavers, he's like a wave of the sea, tossed to and fro. And then he goes on to say in verse 7, let not this man think that he can receive anything from the Lord. Amen. So notice, compromising people can't expect to receive anything from the Lord. 
If you're going to stand in faith one week, then you're going to give up the next. You can't expect to receive anything from the Lord. And it's not that God's being hard. The fact is, He's not going to violate His own word. Can you say amen? amen. So, notice Abraham became unwavering. He staggered not at what God had promised. And later the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 15, so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. What does patient mean? It means unwavering. It means re uh, refusing to change regardless of the circumstances. That's unwavering. That's non-compromising. And the Bible says that's the kind of people that will flourish. That's the kind of people that will abound. Can you say amen? amen? And if you're one of those kind of people, you ought to be shouting right now, amen. praise God. Because that's Hallelujah. God's promise to the faithful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't ever wonder if that's going to happen to me. I don't wonder, I don't, I don't, I don't ask, Lord, do I qualify? I know I qualify. Amen. I've been faithful, praise God. Yes, sir. My wife and I will be married next month. In fact, in 15, 20 days, we'll be married 52 years. And I can say to my wife, for 52 years, there's never been another. I have been faithful. Amen. I can say to my children, I have been faithful. I can say to the Lord, I have been faithful. Amen. I can say to this, uh, this ministry He's given me, I've been faithful to do everything you told me to do. Amen. My lifestyle is faithfulness. Amen. So I qualify. Amen. I don't know where you're headed, but I know where I'm headed, yes, flourishing yes, sir. more and more. Hallelujah. And praise God, if you're faithful, that ought to be what you're saying. I haven't seen my best days yet. Amen. They're just ahead of me, Amen. praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm not being egotistical. I'm just, I just know what I know. Amen. How many of you remember old, uh, the real McCoys back in the, back in the day, of black and white television, and old Grandpa McCoy? He'd say, no brag, just, just fact. fact. <laughs> yes, no brag, just fact. Yes, Hallelujah. Sir. Amen. And you know when you've been faithful or you know when you haven't been. Amen. Yes. Can you say amen? amen? So after he patiently endured, in other words, after he proved that he was non-compromising, then he obtained the promise. And Genesis 24, 1 says this about Abraham. Abraham was old and well stricken in age and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Amen. The Amplified says, in, uh, in, every, in every way. And the message, uh, the message translation rather says, in every way. God blessed him in every area of his life. Amen. Why? He was faithful. Amen. 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 And that's why he's called the father of faith. Amen. Praise God. So the Bible says, follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Yes, Amen. Yes, so that's the reason I follow men like Abraham. I follow Amen. men like the Apostle Paul. Uh, in our generation, I've followed men like Oral Roberts. I've yes, followed sir. men like Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin, T.L. Osborne. Yes, the, these men were all my mentors. They taught me how to live by faith. Amen. And praise God, I followed their example. And not only that, I got the same results, Amen. praise God. And you can get the same results Amen. too. You just have to make a quality decision that quit is no longer an option. Say it with me right now. Lift your right hand and say, Lord, Lord I make the quality decision, the quality decision tonight, tonight that, quitting that quitting is no longer an option, no longer an option. In, Jesus name. in Jesus' name. Amen. Now keep your word. Keep your word. Amen. If you even think about quitting, pray in tongues or go get in church or pick up your Bible or go get a good faith building book and just refuse to give up. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the kind of people that flourish and abound and experience days of glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. So Abraham, he was one of those kind of men. He had days of glory, days of flourishing, and days of abounding. And it didn't end with him. Amen. Once again, Proverbs 28, 20, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. Amen. So if you've been faithful, then get ready. Praise Amen. God. Get ready. It's God's Word. The Bible says that His Word will not return void. Amen. Amen. The message translation says it will accomplish what it was sent to do. The assignment it was given. Amen. Hallelujah. So you just stay faithful and you don't have to wonder or worry about God being faithful. He's more faithful than we are. Amen. But if we're faithful 
then you don't have to be concerned about God keeping His Word. He is faithful. So if you're one of the faithful, get ready. Flourishing is coming your way. Abounding is coming your way. Hallelujah. Let me say, well, when? Well, just stay faithful. Faithful people don't ask when. They just stay faithful. But how long? Faithful people don't ask how long. They just stay faithful. Amen. Moving right along. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you this. Or I might use the phrase if I didn't remind you of this because most of you know this. Flourishing and abounding is not likely without developing a lifestyle of sowing. Did I lose my audience? Got very little response. It's not possible to flourish or to abound without developing a lifestyle of sowing. Amen. I remember years ago, I was, I was uh, preaching in, in a city in Kansas, and I had driven from Fort Worth. And uh, I'm driving up through Oklahoma. You know, it's, I was on Interstate 35, right out of Fort Worth, never got off Interstate 35. I'm coming up through Kansas, and it was the time of the year where harvesting was taking place. And I had to go through an area of the country where there was great wheat fields on both sides of the interstate, wheat fields. And I'm just amazed at how beautiful that wheat was. And it just looked like it just went on for miles and miles. And uh, uh, it was a, a breeze, a wind, and that, that wheat was just blowing with the wind. It almost looked like, uh, you know, uh, waves of the ocean out there. And so I drove to wherever I was going to preach, and I decided to drive back to Oklahoma City after the service and spend the night. And I'm driving back, and it's after midnight. And now I came through that same area where all those wheat fields were. And I could see off in the distance these headlights. And so I slowed down to see, what is that out in that field? And it was this huge combine. And that farmer was harvesting. Now, while everybody was asleep, everybody else was asleep, that farmer was out there harvesting. Amen. And the Lord said, you've been an aggressive sower ever since you came into the knowledge of the truth. You learned sowing immediately. But you haven't been as aggressive harvesting. Mm -hmm. And a lot of your harvest is dying in the field. He said, that man is an aggressive harvester. Yes, sir. Now, I was born on a farm in Mississippi. My grandfather had about 80 acres. He bought the farm in 1927. I was telling Pastor we were talking about it earlier before coming in to the service. And uh, my grandfather, uh, he bought that farm in 1927. My dad was raised there. I was born there. And, and we left and moved to Shreveport, Louisiana when I was a young boy. But I would spend my summers uh, with my grandparents in Mississippi. And I loved going to the farm. Uh, my grandfather kept a uh, 100 head of hogs on the farm about that much in cattle and he had s several acres that he planted and harvested and sold it at the market. And that's how he made it through the depression in 1927 because he had the farm and he was able to sell the produce and so forth. And uh, every, every uh, spring when I would uh, be with my grandfather in his sowing time, um, he had an old tractor and I'd get on the back of that tractor and ride to the he, he, he called it the flat where he planted all his crops. It's real hilly in Mississippi, but he had this area that several acres it was flat. And so he said, let's go to the flat, son. I get on the back of that tractor, stand on the back behind him. And he'd say, son, we're going to have a good harvest this year. I say, Grandpa, you say that every year. How do you know we're going to have a good harvest? He said, well, son, I'll never forget this. He said, well, son, this is good old Mississippi Delta soil. He said, you can throw a stick in the ground, it'll become a tree in this kind of soil. <laughs> good old Mississippi Delta soil. And he never had bad crops. He always had good crops. He believed in his seed and he believed in the soil. Amen. And he believed in the law of seed time and harvest. Amen. 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 And he'd say that every year. Son, we're going to have a good... And he knew what I was going to say. We're going to have a good harvest this year. 
I say, Grandpa, how do you know that? Well, son, this is good old Mississippi yeah. Delta soil. Amen. It's rich. You know, that Mississippi River starts way up in, North, uh, in uh, Minnesota, uh, way up there. And it just keeps coming down to the Gulf Coast. And it brings down all the nutrients and all that from all those lands and dumps it right there in the Delta. Yeah. Oh, it used to be cotton was king down there, you know, in the day. And, uh, but Grandpa just believed in his seed. He believed in the soil. And he believed the law of seed time and harvest. Because the Bible says, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. Amen. Amen. It shall not cease. And if you look in Genesis chapter 1, when God created man, it says in about verse 27, I believe it is, He said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, and for you it shall be for meat. Yes. Now the literal Hebrew says, uh, it's a word that can be translated into uh, provision. He said, I've given you seed, and it's for provision. So in other words, when God created man, His intent was that man become a seed sower, and that's the way He would have His life sustained. Amen. And that principle has never changed. Amen. You and I have our lives sustained by the seeds we sow. Amen. Uh, the Apostle Paul picks up on this in Galatians and says uh, uh, that uh, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I believe it's the Phillips translation says, a man's harvest in life depends entirely upon the seeds which he sows. Amen. 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 Now when I was uh, growing up, you know, and, and, and running from God, uh, I'd hear people say, one of these days, you're going to reap what you sow. You're going you're gonna to reap what you sow. You're gonna, those, old, those, those, those wild seeds you've been sowing are going to come up. I never heard anybody talk about the positive side of it. You know, it was always in the negative. Yeah, You're going to reap what you sow. You're going to reap what you sow. And then when you start talking about it in the positive, people get upset with you. Yes. Well, how do you know? Well, the Bible says so. Yes. And most of the time it's the same people that were just firmly believing you're going to reap what you sow in the negative. Amen. Some of them wild oats are going to come up, boy. God going to get you. Well, we didn't have any trouble believing it in the negative. Why do we have a problem with it in the positive? Yes, amen. A man's harvest in life depends entirely upon the seeds he sows. I am today the sum total of what I've been sowing for 49 years. If I hadn't learned this principle, I wouldn't be living the life I'm living right now. Amen. And the flourishing and the abounding is not only faithfulness to God, but it's also faithfulness to His Word. Amen. And the Bible says in Galatians, let ev I mean in 2 Corinthians 9, let every man purpose in his heart what he will sow. Amen. <laughs> That's not a suggestion. Amen. But He clearly states, you need to make a determination. You need to become resolute that you're going to be a sower. Not occasionally. Not just on Sunday. Not just in church. You live to give. You live to give. You're always looking for opportunities to sow. And it's not always in the form of money. Sometimes it can be just a, a pat on the back, an encouraging word. Amen. When I first started learning this, I didn't have a lot of money to sow. I had debts. If somebody had given me $100, I had to split it up 10 ways and pay 10 different notes. You know. So what seed I had was small. But I was determined that I was going to be a sower for life. Amen. Amen. I'm, a Amen. I'm a sower. A sower for life. And, and, and the Bible says, I remember John Osteen teaching me this when I was just real young in the ministry. And John said, Brother Jerry, don't ever despise small beginnings. Amen. I said, Brother John, I wish I had more money to sow. I was, I was down there in Houston at, when he was pastoring that church when he was still in a feed store. About less than 400 people there. And I went to hear John Osteen. And, and uh, I just fell in love with the man. And, and I wanted to sow into his ministry. I didn't have a dollar to sow. 
And somebody walked up to me and gave me $5. And I, I put it in Brother John's hand. I said, I got some yes, seed sir. to sow. Amen. I said, it's not much, but I'm sowing it. And, I, and I'll never forget him telling me, don't ever despise small beginnings. Amen. Sow what you've got. Amen. God will increase your seed for sowing. Amen. Your resources for sowing. Amen. Amen. And he did. Yes. Amen. So you're faithful to God, but you're also faithful to his word. Amen. And God expects from day one when he created man, he intended for man to be a seed sower. Yes. That's how he would have his life sustained. And nothing's changed. God's expecting you and I to be seed sowers. Amen. Amen. So, you know, you get excited about flourishing. But hey, are you sowing? You see flourishing crops out here in these farms in Kansas? Amen. It didn't just zowie happen one day. Somebody sowed. Amen. Somebody sowed. Amen. When they get flourishing crops, it's because somebody sowed. That's right. Amen. And, and, and did you notice that farmers, that's what they do. Amen. You know, if my wife uh, digs up the, the weeds in a, in a piece of uh, soil there in front of our house and starts planting flowers in it, you know, she expects them to grow. And then every year she may, my wife, she changes what she's going to, have for next year. And one year, she went out in the back and, and just in a flower bed, she got up all the old flowers and she tilled around in there and she planted some tomatoes. And some tomatoes came up. But nobody accused her of being a farmer. Yeah. You're, not, you're not a farmer just because you plant some tomatoes in the flower bed one year. Yeah. And you're not a sower if you just gave an offering at church one time. You're a sower when it's lifestyle. If you just sow one time, you just sowed. But a sower never stops sowing. It's lifestyle. Can you say amen? I mean, you don't, you don't call somebody that uh, raises the hood on their car, looks down in there and fools with a spark plug wire, a mechanic. Right. You don't call somebody that's got a beanie with a propeller on it a pilot. Right. <laughs> Amen. And you don't call people who sowed one time in church sowers. Amen. Sowers. Yes. That describes their lifestyle. Yes, sir. They sow. Amen. Consistently. Amen. All the time. Amen. The Bible says in, in Galatians 6 from the Apostle Paul, be mindful to be a blessing. Yes, sir. In other words, every morning when you get up, Lord, show me where I can be a blessing. Right. Show me where I can sow. Lead me to somebody I can sow into. And whether it's money or a kind word or a helping hand, you're sowing. You're sowing. Encouraging words is sowing. Jesus said the sower sows the word. So when you're sowing kind words, God's word, you're sowing. In other words, you have developed a lifestyle of sowing. And when you do, then praise God, it won't be long. It won't happen all overnight. But see, remember now, Amen. you're uncompromising. You don't give up if it doesn't happen in a night. You stick with it, praise God. You just keep doing it. It's lifestyle with you. Amen. It's just like breathing. Amen. 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 Hey, you don't have to stop and think, shut up, breathe today. You get up and you breathe. Right. Amen. If you don't breathe, you don't get up. Right. Amen. Amen. You just do it. Amen. Well, I don't have to stop and think if I should sow or not. I sow. I live to give. It's the, it's the grandest thing and the most exciting thing Amen. that I do in my life. It's so, hallelujah. Amen. And because of it, God sees to it I have flourishing crops. Yes, hallelujah. Yes, Give the Lord a shout if you believe it. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Now, I'm, not, I'm not preaching this for you to do this. I'm just preaching the word, hallelujah. How many of you want to flourish? Lift your hand and say, I want to flourish, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Now listen. There is something to shout about. Hallelujah. Now listen to this. 
Proverbs 11. You can be seated. I'm not done yet. Don't have to go home till in the morning. <laughs> I was flying home tonight, but we changed our plans. We're staying overnight. Proverbs 11, 24. It says, There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. Now notice there's a person here, the Bible says, that's always looking for an opportunity to scatter seed, sow seed. Always looking for an opportunity to sow seed. And it says, and while he's sowing seed, the results will be he increases. There's one translation that says, it is possible to give away everything you have and yet experience more. Well, that's the law of seed time and harvest. Amen. Can you say amen? Amen. You know, I'm, and, and I say this to the glory of God. Uh, I, I wouldn't have this testimony if it wasn't for God. When, when, when I came to the Lord in February of 1969, uh, through Kenneth Copeland's ministry, he came back a second time to that church. And now I'm, I'm a church attending Christian, you know. And so uh, I could hardly wait for him to get back. And so when he came back, uh, I had an opportunity to meet him. And I won't go into all the things, that, how that all happened. But I got, had an opportunity to meet him. And so one night, about the third night of his meeting, he was preaching just like he did the first time I heard him. He just stopped about 15 minutes into his sermon. And he said, Jerry, stand up. I, I was sitting about where uh, Aaron's sitting, that far back. And he said, Jerry, stand up. I stood up. I didn't have a clue what he was going to do. And he said, uh, the Lord showed me in prayer today that you and I will be a team and we'll spend the rest of our lives together preaching the Word of God around the world. And it'll be your responsibility to believe God for the perfect timing for the team to begin. Set out. <laughs> then he went back to preaching. I turned to my wife. I said, what did that mean? She said, I think we're moving to Fort Worth. I said, I'm going to be preaching with Kenneth Copeland. Because I, I wasn't familiar with prophecy and all that word of wisdom and word of knowledge and all, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm three months old in the Lord. You know, I don't have any religious training. And so uh, I said, you mean I'm going to be preaching with Kenneth Copeland? She said, sounds like it. You're going to be a team. He said, preach together for the rest of your lives. I said, she said, I think we're moving to Texas. And so about five months later, uh, and now I'm preaching, you know, ministering. And, and uh, he called and asked me to come meet him in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And it was while we were there that uh, the Lord said, it's time to go. So I came back home and I'm getting ready to move to Fort Worth. Now, we're just about to move into 1970. And so our pastor, Jack Moore, said that we're going to have a watch night service uh, New Year's Eve, December 31st, 1969. And he said, I've invited a man that I consider to be a prophet to speak during the watch night service. And uh, he said that he received a word from the Lord that all the men in the church need to be there. Because he had a word for the men, especially. So I'd never been to a watch night service. I didn't even know what it was. I said, Carolyn, what's a watch night service? She said, well, we have church until after midnight. I said, okay, I'm ready. So we went. And this prophet spoke for about an hour or so. And then he said, I want all the men in the church to line up around the walls and you're going to make your way up to the front. And I'm going to be standing here facing the auditorium, the audience. And pastor is going to stand on this side. And you're going to walk between us. And we're going to lay hands on you. And I may or may not have a word for you. If not, we're going to pray for you. Then you go on and take your seat. And then the line keep moving. So I got in line. I'm way back at the back, you know. And, and so we just, it took a long time. There's about 200 men in that line. And so by the time I'm next, I walk up there and the man puts his hand on me. Pastor puts his hand on me. And all of a sudden the prophet says, airplanes, airplanes, airplanes. And pastor said, oh yeah, fly, fly, fly. <laughs> I didn't have a clue what that meant. So I started to walk off. He said, no, 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 young man, wait, there's more. So I backed up. 
He put his hands on me again. The pastor put his hands on me. The prophet said, airplanes, airplanes, airplanes. The pastor said, oh yeah, fly, fly, fly. So I started to walk off again. No, come back, there's more, there's more. So I backed up. Airplanes, airplanes, airplanes. The pastor said, oh yeah, fly, fly, fly. So I just stood there. They didn't say anything else. So I thought, well, they're done. So I walked off. Walked back to my seat and I asked my wife, what did that mean? <laughs> she said, sounds like to me, boy, you're going to be in an airplane for the rest of your life. Fly, fly, fly. <laughs> now that was, that was December 31st, 1969. Okay. When I went to work with Brother Copeland the next year, he had just started, he'd only been in the ministry now, that coming into 1970, three years. And uh, he got his first airplane, which was a little small, I called it a lawnmower with wings. It was just a little small Cessna Skyline. And, but it was paid for, praise God. And he, he, he's teaching me how he got it. He said, I sowed for this. I, I learned the, the, the law of seed time and harvest through Oral Roberts. And he said, I sowed seed for this. And, and God blessed me with this little airplane. And Brother Copeland had been a commercial pilot, a charter pilot, before going into the ministry. And so um, we're flying around this little airplane, you know. And then while I was working with him, I saw him believe in his second airplane. And it was a twin-engine 310 Cessna. And it's faster, and we could fly higher, you know. And we're flying around there and enjoying this little airplane. And then the last year I was with him as his associate ministry before launching out into this ministry. We were in Birmingham, Alabama, and he said, uh, I want you to come to my room every morning at 6 o'clock. Let's pray together. I got some decisions to make. I got some things I'm believing for. So I'd go down to his room, the old holiday inn there in Birmingham, and we'd pray together. And then I'd go back to my room, and then we'd go have breakfast every morning. And uh, the last morning we did this, I went back to my room, but I heard my phone ringing inside before I could get in. And I unlocked the door, and I ran to the phone, picked it up, and it was Brother Colton. He said, get on back down here. I just got the wisdom of God. God. And uh, so I ran back down to his room. He said, and he was launching his television ministry, and he didn't have the money for it. He didn't know how he was going to do it. Not only that, but he was believing for a bigger, better, faster airplane. And he said, God told me how we're going to do this. He said, I'm going to sow this airplane into another ministry. And God said, that would be my seed to launch our television ministry and for my next airplane. And so he called the man that the Lord told him to give it to. And he was out in California at the time. And I, I heard Brother Copeland say, I'm giving you my airplane. And I could hear the guy shouting on the other end through the phone. Brother Colton had to hold it out here like this. And then he said, and Joe, uh, before I give it to you, it's, it's time to do an annual on it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the annual for you so the plane will be first class when I give it to you. So he spent some more money on it, bringing it up to proper condition before he gave it away. Now, I'm, I'm taking notes on all this. You know, follow those who faith and patience inherit the promises. I'm watching how he's doing this. This is the way the man lives. I'm learning to live this way, see? And so uh, I went back to my room and, and uh, we had a three-day meeting there. And then we flew, flew home in the airplane. And uh, Brother Copeland sent it out to get the annual done. And then when he had it ready, he called the man. And I was there when he gave it to the man debt-free, Gave him the title deed to it, handed him the keys, and the man was rejoicing. Eleven days later, Brother Copeland calls me at about oh, 10, 30, 11 o'clock one night. Jerry, it's Kenneth. I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, would you and the girl, uh, Carolyn and the girls like to see a miracle? I said, yes, sir. We love seeing miracles. He said, meet me out at Oak Grove Airport right now. I had to wake everybody up. My kids were asleep. <laughs> my wife was asleep. I woke them all up. I said, Brother Copeland said, meet him out at Oak Grove Airport uh, and we'd see a miracle. So we, we drove out there 
And when we got there, Brother Copeland was standing on the tarmac, just looking off into the distance. Gloria was standing next to him, looking in the same direction. Kelly, she's a little girl. She's looking off where her mom and dad was. And John was a little boy. And they all four standing there. Nobody said a word, just looking off in the distance. So we just got in line, started looking <laughs> off in the distance. I don't have a clue what we're looking for. But he said, we're going to see a miracle. So I'm looking for a miracle. In a little while, I saw some lights coming on final approach. And then it landed and pulled up right there in front of the Copelands where we were all standing. And it was a, it was a Cessna uh, 414 uh, turboprop uh, pressurized cabin, beautiful airplane. And the guy got out of it, walked up to Brother Copeland, handed him the title deed and handed him the keys. He said, here's, here's uh, the airplane that God told me to bless you with. Not only that, but just a few days later, the money came in to launch the television Praise ministry. Yes. Amen. God. Now, Praise you know, when you see those kind of things happen, it marks you. Yes. It marks you. Yes. So the Lord had said to me before I even went to work with Brother Copeland after that incident with the prophet with the airplanes, airplanes, he said, there will come a day when you will not be able to fulfill what I've called you to do without airplanes in your ministry. Amen. And he said, start believing for your airplanes now and start sowing for them now before you ever need them. Amen. So I started sowing before I ever needed. I started believing before I ever need. He said, don't wait until you need it and then start believing. He said, get the jump on the thing. Start believing now, start sowing now, and when you need it, it'll manifest. Amen. And so I watched Brother Copeland believe in three different airplanes debt-free by sowing. And then when I launched out into this ministry, uh, I mean, from day one, I couldn't get to all the places I was invited to preach. Finally, it got to the place where I can't get to all these places without an airplane. Yes, but I already had seed. Yes, sir. However, not one person, anywhere I preached, I never, I never told anybody, I don't con people. You know, I don't walk up saying, uh, I'm believing for an airplane, is God speaking to you? No. I don't do that kind of stuff. That's religious con work. And I don't do that. Never have. Never will. And so I never told anybody. The only people that knew was my family. And by this time, I've got two employees. And that's the only people that knew that I was believing for an airplane. And Brother Copeland, because I sewed into his aviation department. Because I knew... Man, every seed produces after its own kind. You believe for an airplane, sow into somebody else's airplane. Believe for a car, sow into somebody else's car. Believe for a house, sow into somebody else's house. Every seed produces after its own kind. Amen. Amen. And so now I need an airplane. I can't, I can't fulfill what I'm called to do without it. And God blessed me with my first airplane. And uh, Vicki and Wes Jameson. Anybody remember Vicki Jameson? Vicki and Wes Jamison owned an airplane and uh, they called me and wanted me to meet them for dinner in Dallas. I didn't have a clue that this was going to happen, but I went over to have dinner with them and they said to me, and Charles and Peggy Capps were with them, and they said to me, God spoke to us a year ago to give you this airplane, but we had debt on it. And the Lord said, don't give it to him until you have it paid for because I told him, I don't want him flying airplanes with debt on them. I want him to believe in debt-free airplanes. He said, so we still had, uh, we've been paying the note, you know, and we've still been believing to pay it off. And said, and Charles and Peggy came to visit us, and uh, we just asked them to get an agreement with us that we'd get the money soon, because we knew you needed it now, and uh, that the money would manifest so we could pay it off and get it to you. And Charles and Peggy were sitting in their home when they said this. And Charles looked to Peggy and said, uh, well, Peggy, we just, we just got in crops, you know, and, and uh, uh, how much do you need? And they told him how much they needed. Charles said, well, that's our tithe amount. We got that in tithe. We're going to give you the rest of it so you can give Jerry that plane. So that first plane manifested, okay? Now, I flew that little plane. I'm telling you, that was, that was a joy. To, do, to, to sit in something that people said was impossible. 
to watch God work. Anybody ever felt that way? To watch God do something that people said was impossible. Not only that, a country bumpkin like me flying around in a paid for airplane. Every time I'd land somewhere, I'd wonder how many other people can say their airplane's paid for on this airport, you know? And God blessed me with my first debt free airplane. And I, and I praise him every time I got in it. And then the Lord said, I want you to sow it for your next one. Well, I learned watching Brother Copeland. He sowed. Now, you don't just do this, you know, because somebody else did. I had faith for it because I watched somebody do it and saw it work, and I did it and saw it work, and so I knew what to do. Because remember what God said? I give you every herb bearing seed and it will be for meat or provision. So this is how God provides by sowing seed. Amen. You want every need met in your life? God told me years ago, quit being need minded, start becoming seed minded. Because if you become seed minded, then praise God, that'll take care of your needs. So I gave that airplane into another ministry. And it was about a year or so later, God blessed me with a second airplane. I flew that airplane and one day the Lord said, give that airplane to Happy Caldwell. I sewed it into Happy. It was his first airplane. And uh, he flew it all over the country. And the Lord blessed me with a, a bigger and a better one. And then the Lord said, sew this one. I'm in my 10th debt-free airplane. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the one I flew here tonight is the biggest, best, Hallelujah. fastest. Amen. Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> It'll point your hair, man. I was telling Pastor, we flew home from Sacramento, California, Sunday afternoon. 42,000 feet, 504 miles an hour. Amen. That will outdrag a Chevrolet. Do you understand Amen. this? <laughs> I'm sitting up there waving at the commercial airlines as I go by, praise God. And God did it. I called 10 debt-free airplanes, and every one of them came by sowing. Every time I outgrew one, I sowed it. I sowed it. I sowed it into ministries all over the country. And God blessed me with better. And it didn't happen overnight. Didn't happen in a month most of the time. But the one I'm in now was the quickest manifesting airplane I've ever owned. Hallelujah. I I was up in Boston preaching. I flew up there commercial because I'd given my, I had a Citation 500 Eagle that I'd given to another ministry. And I flew up there commercial. And I got out of that service and the Lord said, and and I really thought at that point that maybe I would slow down some and maybe I didn't need airplanes anymore. And my wife said, well, what are you believing for now that you're giving this one away? I said, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm going to be involved in aviation anymore. I think I'm going to slow down some. Enjoy the fruit of my labor. Not quit, not retire. It's not in my thinking. But just slow down. Enjoy my grandchildren more. And she didn't say it at that moment. But later she told me, uh, I didn't believe that when you said it. You know? <laughs> and so that's not you. And so I really wasn't believing for another airplane. And I got up in Boston, got out of that service, and I went to my hotel room and I was hanging up my suit and the Lord said, are you finished? I said, finished what? He said, in the ministry. I said, no, sir, I'm not finished. He said, are you done? I said, no, sir, I'm not done. He said, what did I tell you in 1969? I said, well, you told me several things. What are you referring to? About aviation. I said, well, you told me that I wouldn't be able to fulfill what I'm called to do without airplanes in my ministry. He said, well, then are you done? I said, no, sir. He said, are you finished in the ministry? I said, no, sir. I'm not even thinking about being done or finished. He said, then why aren't you believing for your next airplane? I said, well, Lord, I thought maybe I'd slow down some and I just wouldn't need airplanes like I have in the past. He said, now, whose idea was that? You know, I, I already knew I was caught. I said, well, I know it wasn't your idea. It must have been my idea. He said, well, if you're not through in the ministry and I told you you couldn't fulfill what you're called to do without airplanes, then get back on your faith. Amen. Wow. 
So, man, I come home, told my wife, and that's when she told me. I didn't believe that when you told me anyway. I, I thought it was just a matter of time that, you know, you'd get back on your faith again. So I went to sowing, sowing seed. And that airplane manifested quicker than any man, uh, airplane I'd ever believed God for. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I call 10 debt-free airplanes in 49 years flourishing. Yes, sir. And the flourishing is because faithfulness to God Amen. and faithfulness to His laws in His Word, His Amen. principles in His Word. Amen. 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 I, I wouldn't have the testimony of flourishing if I wasn't a sower. Can you say amen? amen? So I want to challenge you tonight. If you believe that God wants you to have days of glory, days of flourishing, days of abounding, then make sure you never, never, never stop sowing. Amen. 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 And once again, it doesn't have to be money. Sow a kind word. Sow a helping hand. You know, uh, one time I didn't have any money to, to sow and I went over and I got my lawnmower and I went over and mowed my neighbor's yard. They said, what are you doing? I said, sowing. And I didn't even bother explaining. Just kept mowing. <laughs> you know, I sowed. That was all the seed I had was my, my manual labor. Amen. Blessing somebody Amen. by mowing their grass. Yes. I've taken tithes off when I, when I didn't have seed to sow financially. And I'd give the tithe to somebody. You know, it doesn't have to, always have to be money. But it does mean if you're going to be a sower, you sow consistently. Your lifestyle is sowing. You live to give. Amen. 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 And praise God, God will see to it. His word comes to pass. It will fulfill the assignment it has been given. And praise God, eventually, may not be overnight, but hey, faithful people don't even think about overnight. Faithful people just keep doing it. Just Amen. keep living it. Keep living it. Amen. Keep practicing. Never quit. Amen. And one day you'll wake up and think, where, where, did, where did all this come from? Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Flourishing. Amen. Abounding. Amen. That's my word to you tonight. Give the Lord a shout if you believe it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Stand to your feet if you will, please. Hallelujah. 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 Do you receive tonight? Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, I have delivered your word tonight. I believe exactly what you told me to say in my prayer time today. I trust that I have pleased you in my delivery. And I pray that not one word will fall to the ground, that it will lodge in the hearts of every person who heard it. I pray they'll be doers of your word and not hearers only. And you said that the doer will be blessed in their deeds. So I thank you, Father, in advance for blessing doers tonight, blessing those that take your word and apply it to their lives. And Father, I'm believing with them that these will indeed be days of glory, days of flourishing, and days of abounding. Hallelujah. That's your will for the faithful. That's your plan for the faithful. And so we're expecting it right now. We, we are anticipating some of the greatest miracles, breakthroughs that we've ever experienced during the course of this year. And we thank you for it in advance. Come on, lift your hands and thank God in advance. Hallelujah. For days of glory, days of flourishing, and days of abounding. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. And Lord, I add to that, I'm praying over this congregation that many will experience supernatural debt cancellation. Hallelujah. Lord, you've been known to do that. I've experienced it uh, in the past. And, and I know people that are experiencing it right now. And I'm believing in Jesus' name for supernatural debt cancellation. Lord, you have ways of, of bringing uh, financial prosperity into our lives 
so many ways that we couldn't think them up in a hundred years. So Lord, I believe that you're working behind the scenes even now, rearranging things, uh, manipulating things uh, to cause supernatural breakthroughs, financial blessings, flourishing harvest come their way in the mighty name of Jesus. If you receive it, give the Lord your best shout. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Ken, you want to do that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You can have your seat for a moment. Glory to God. We are uh, we're going to receive tonight's offering. Hallelujah. Uh, there will be a couple of ushers in the aisle. If you'd like an envelope, you can sow into the kingdom of God tonight. Uh, we're not going to take very much time, but uh, Brother Jerry uh, quoted the scripture that the Lord was dealing with me about this afternoon. Uh, you know, the Bible says that every seed produces after its own kind. And uh, you sow uh, financial seed, you reap financial harvest. Hallelujah. And uh, the ground you're sowing in is good ground. Amen. Good ground. Amen. Hallelujah. Good old Mississippi Delta soil. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I believe God. I believe God. We are fat and flourishing. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. While they're passing out the envelopes, it's also good to have uh, Pastor Rafael Hernandez with us tonight. Amen. And uh, uh, Lon and Rebecca May over here, they, uh, uh, Pastor Rafael and Brother Lon, they've been uh, ministering at the Bible College uh, here and uh, just uh, have thriving ministries of their own, been friends a long time, and we're just, you know, it's, it's good to have friends of your own company. Amen. There's just something about coming together with people of like precious faith. And uh, these are, these are uh, two men that I really highly value their friendship and honor them. And so we're, I'm glad you all are here tonight. Amen. Come on, guys. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And when you're ready to sow tonight, why don't you just come rejoicing? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. While they're doing that, I just want to introduce you to some of the product that we have back there on the table. Uh, really, Thank you, Jesus. it doesn't need much introduction because <laughs> it goes right along with what he preached tonight. His latest CD series, Quitting is Not an Option. This is the series he did for 2018, Days of Glory. Days of flourishing and days of abounding. Amen. This is his latest book, The Faithful Shall Flourish. And then Miss Carolyn has got a brand new book called The Power of the Blood. And I don't think that takes much explanation either, does it? But you don't hear too much preached about it anymore, do you? But these things are available back in the back. Hallelujah. Well, are you glad you came tonight? Yes. Amen. Glory be to God. Well, let's stand up tonight. Glory be to God. I believe God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's just lift our hands and thank Him tonight. Let's just thank Him for the Word of God that was sowed into our hearts tonight. I mean, this is life changing. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 
Well, we're certainly glad to see everybody tonight, all of our Chariots members. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Good to see you all the way from Arkansas, right? Yes, sir. Amen. Hallelujah. Arkansas is a good place. Yes, sir. That's where Jesus is building part of his church. Yes, sir. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Lord, were you in Little Rock when Brother Jerry was there? Yes, I thought so. I thought I recognized you. Praise God. God's good to us. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Well, come on, say it with me. The vision of this church is to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you.